expert on China's feminist movement. And she's currently on a book tour of which we get to be a small part uh, to talk about the findings of her new book, The Train Big Brother, which discusses the rise of, of China's feminist movement, especially in the last few years, focusing on, on the so-called Beijing Pride, which is a, a group of, of very inspiring, dynamic women who are really pushing forward uh, feminism in China today. So today she's going to speak a little bit about the findings from her book, uh, and then we will open up to questions as per usual. And then afterwards, you are lucky, uh, there will be a book signing sponsored by Labyrinth, um, starting at 550, just outside here. So uh, you can meet the author and, and maybe get an autograph. Yes? Well, autographs are a fair game. All right, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wang Thank you. Uh, thank you for Um, so I want to just just uh, set the scene. Um, in 2015, there were a group of uh, some group of feminist activists in quite a few different cities across China who wanted to celebrate International Women's Day by handing out anti-sexual harassment stickers on subways and buses. Um, and so International Women's Day is March 8th. Um, they had organized all of this um, and planned to do it, but then a couple of days beforehand, the Chinese police carried out a very sweeping round of arrests in multiple cities, and they detained at least 10 feminist activists for 24 hours, and then ended up focusing on five young women who became known as the Feminist Five. And um, they brought the women who were no, not already in Beijing to Beijing and held them at a detention center. And it looked as though the women were going to be criminally prosecuted uh, for a, a, a form of disturbing the social order. So what I wanted to do first was do a very short reading from my book about um, one of the feminist five named Wei Fengjun. Um, and just she describes her experience when she was first detained. Now, what the Chinese state security agents did first with, with all of the women that they detained was to confiscate their glasses. And four of the feminist five wore glasses. So um, it was in the middle of winter, and this was, uh, so the women were all freezing because there was no heat where they were being detained. Um, but confiscating their glasses was extremely disorienting. And um, I'm just going to start reading first. When Chinese authorities arrested feminist activist Wei Fengjun in Beijing on March 6, 2015, just before International Women's Day, they confiscated her glasses so she could no longer see. Severely visually impaired, Wei was only able to tell people apart by their voices. State security agents took away her cell phone and laptop and demanded her passwords. They led her to a dimly lit underground area of a police station, took her warm snow boots, and put her in a small unheated room about five square meters wide as the temperature outside fell to below freezing. Then the interrogations began. Why are you engaged in subversive actions about sexual harassment? Who is collaborating with you in your women's rights activism? Which foreign agencies are find funding your actions? Wei told the blurry figures in front of her that she wanted to call a lawyer before answering any questions. You can't call a lawyer now. Don't you get it? Don't you understand the law? Wei made it through one round of interrogations and thought it would be over. But in the middle of the night, she had no idea what time it was because she had no watch, the agents took her out for another interrogation. This time, someone videotaped her as she spoke. Even when she went to the toilet, a female agent observed her. For the first time in her life, Wei Fengjun, just 26 years old at the time of her detention, began to think about escaping abroad. She felt disoriented and overwhelmed by a mounting sense of powerlessness. Then she heard some indistinct murmurs seeping through from outside, 
and put her ear up against the wall of her cell to listen more closely. With astonishment, she recognized the voice of one of her feminist sisters, Wong Nai, who had taken part in some activist campaigns with her in the adjacent room. My God, Wang Nan is in here too, she thought. Wei yelled out to a guard that she was thirsty and needed a drink of water, then put her ear up against the wall to listen again. She made out the voices of other feminist activists who had been arrested along with her. Besides Wang Nan, she could hear Li Mai Zi, Li's girlfriend, Jerisa Xu, and several other university students who had volunteered for feminist campaigns in the past. Wei later described how she overcame her feeling of hopelessness in an online essay she called Prison Notes, which she posted on WeChat under a pseudonym. I decided I must resist this feeling of sorrow and take action, so I started to do a lot of different things. My room was freezing and I was only allowed to wear slippers, so I began doing leg exercises, such as kicks and squats. Then I did deep meditation exercises. Other people before me had scratched words onto the old walls, so I squinted my eyes up close to the walls to examine them. Then I spun around in circles, singing songs, she wrote. Wei sang out loud, both to cheer herself up and to let the other detained women hear her voice and know that they were not alone, that she too was in there with them. Li Maizu also sang back a song for all women, the anthem of China's feminist movement. Protect my rights, don't keep me down. Why must I lose my freedom? Let's break free from our heavy shackles and reclaim our power as women. Her spirits void, Wei Jingting writes. She recovered her sense of defiance. Even as I heard two guards walking back and forth, making clanking noises outside, I felt a kind of joy in betraying Big Brother. So that's where the title of the book comes from. Um, I just thought it really perfectly encapsulates the whole situation of this, the feminist activism in, in this Orwellian uh, surveillance state where Big Brother is always watching them. And, and it's also a very male gaze and surveillance. So um, here's a picture of the young women. Li um, Maizu on the upper left, Wu uh, Rong on the upper right, and then from the left, Wang Man, Wei Jingjing, and Zheng Turan. Um, now, uh, here are also a couple of activities that um, about 100 or so feminist activists were involved in in the years leading up to the arrest of the Feminist Five. Um, they became quite active starting in 2012, and so on the, uh, the upper picture is um, the Bloody Brides Act of performance art to raise awareness about the epidemic of domestic violence in China. Um, so the three young women, two of whom were later jailed, actually, the, the woman in the middle and then on the right were part of the Feminist Five. Um, so they're wearing these white wedding gowns stained with faux red blood and holding signs like, love is no excuse for violence. Um, another action that they organized that was quite popular was in Guangzhou called Occupy Men's Toilets, where the women took over a men's public bathroom, and then they allowed women into uh, the vacated stalls to just draw attention to uh, the fact that there weren't enough public restrooms for women. And in fact, that action got a lot of very positive news coverage in the state media, in Xinhua News, and I believe even People's Daily. Um, so prior to 2015, these women were always deliberately choosing topics that they thought were not politically controversial um, because the Chinese government officially supported gender equality. So it was such a shock when these women were jailed um, just for handing out, or they didn't even hand them out, they were just for planning to celebrate International Women's Day by handing out anti-sexual harassment stickers. Um, and the authorities in jailing these women clearly thought that they could wipe out the potential of a large-scale feminist movement uh, developing, but in fact, the reverse happened. 
because the jailing of the women sparked such a huge global outcry, um, and, and inside China as well, it really galvanized the feminist community, uh, which had previously been sort of very diffuse, um, isolated acts of performance art, and I wouldn't have called it a real political movement at that point, um, and really gave it energy. Um, and then, as you see, here's a tweet from Hillary Clinton, uh, who at the time was considered to be the front runner for the US presidency, expressing her outrage. Xi hosting a meeting on women's rights at the UN while persecuting feminists, shameless. So she's referring to the fact that Chinese President Xi Jinping was, just as he was jailing feminist activists, um, was about to co-host this world conference on women's rights at the UN in New York. So the hypocrisy is so blatant. Um, she wasn't the only major uh, politician to express her indignation. There was a lot of diplomatic outrage expressed. And um, inside China, the feminist community organized a social media solidarity campaign where they marked each day of detention of the feminists. Um, so the first day, that upper picture um, shows these five women wearing the masks of the feminist five, crossing the street, the, kind of taken from uh, the Beatles' Abbey Road album. <laughs> but, but each day, they would say, the first day of the uh, feminists uh, being arrested, and then each day they would mark another day and it would show another uh, five different women wearing the masks of the feminist five in some outdoor activity, acting with freedom of movement. Um, because of course they were in jail, they were uh, oppressed and they could not move or express themselves freely. And so this went on for 37 days, the women were held and then I will never know for sure exactly why the government decided to release them, but that was what was unusual. It was unusual that these women appeared to be on course for criminal prosecution, possibly facing a jail sentence of it. five years or more, and then after 37 days, they were suddenly released, and I believe it was because of this unprecedented global outcry. Um, so, for the first few months, well, let me get you here for a second. For the first few months after they were, the women were technically released, they were under de facto house arrest. So it was really difficult to get to them. But then um, after a few months, these women were, are still technically criminal suspects. Uh, but after a few months, the police loosened their grip a little bit. And at the towards the end of 2015, I. I actually approached them all in different cities, and they I, and I interviewed them, and they were all very uh, eager to be interviewed. Um, and it was at that time that I realized that actually this feminist network is much bigger than I had realized, and it was very interesting. And so I started interviewing more and more feminist activists, um, and decided to write this book. So. One thing that I, uh, I argue in this book is, I won't dwell on this too much, but um, I argue that, um, that patriarchal authoritarianism has been very central, uh, particularly in the last few decades since the onset of market reforms. It's been central to the Communist Party's survival, that it, it is dependent on, or it, the male-dominated party sees the subjugation of women as necessary to exerting authoritarian control over the entire country. Um, and it does this in many different ways. Um, one of the ways is by, uh, ever since the founding of the People's Republic, the Communist Party has viewed women as reproductive tools of the state. Um, and that's manifested today um, so, so for, for many years under the so-called one-child policy, it forced uh, women to often to abort 
um, fetuses or in, in do mass insertion of IUDs. I mean, those kinds of abuses of women's rights are widely documented. But now the, uh, the government is pursuing the opposite approach to population planning. And as of the last two and a half years, it's been uh, it's implemented an official two-child policy, and now it's very aggressively trying to push young, particularly educated women, into marrying and having two children. And so the propaganda today and the policies, accompanying policies, are very much pushing women to return to the home to play the role of dutiful wife and mother. Um, so I just wanted to give you an example of how um, this patriarchal authoritarianism is expressed through the propaganda. Last year, this was on CCTV, Chinese state television, um, the concept of family state under heaven was introduced. And these images uh, just present Xi Jinping as a strong man, authoritarian ruler, um, this paternalistic patriarch ruling over uh, an accretion of millions of male-dominated families. So this, there was a long article in Xinhua News last year, and this is just a little quote. C stresses the importance of family values. He says little family, xiao jia, but he has in mind the big family, guo jia. Guo jia means nation state in China, and the jia character means family. And so this Xinhua article just parses out the word family in great detail. Um, and the way in which it describes women playing their important role in taking care of the harmonious family at home, taking, having babies, rearing the babies, rearing children, and taking care of the elderly. That, that, um, that's really reminiscent of centuries old Confucian didactic texts. Um, and I give an example here from the Qing Dynasty, biographies of exemplary women. Quote, the daughter obeys her parents. The daughter-in-law reverently serves her parents-in-law. The wife assists her husband. The mother guides her sons and daughters. When every family is harmonious, the state is well governed. And that could word for word be used, actually, it is almost word for word used in a lot of the propaganda you see today in People's Daily or Xinhua News or on um, CCTV. So if you look at these images, first of all, on top you have Xi Jinping as the playing the proper role of father to his daughter. Um, but even more importantly, below, he's playing the role of filial son, taking care of his elderly mother. And so there's very much this um, emphasis on, uh, particularly on women, playing the subordinate role, that they have to take care of the family. While men, and, and in particular Xi Jinping himself, are presented as going out into the world the world, being the head of the family, um, working. Um, and just briefly, um, there's been a lot written about the personality cult surrounding Xi Jinping that is reminiscent of the Mao era, um, which is really uh, it goes against decades of um, leadership based on consensus, where the, the imagery is all revolving around this one man. And of course, um, China abolished presidential term limits earlier this year as well, so Xi Jinping could theoretically be China's ruler for life. Um, so some of the ways in which this, what I think this hyper-masculine personality cult sort of reveals itself is in the uh, in the pop culture, in music, there is this hip hop song, if you want to marry, marry someone like Si Dada, which could roughly be translated to Big Daddy Si. Well, they, they actually got rid of the term Si Dada after I, I think the party decided it was becoming too cultish, um, but it was very popular until at least the mid 
to mid 2016. Um, so you have this hip hop beat and very manly images of Xi Jinping um, like parading down Tiananmen Square, inspecting the troops. There are some seats here if you'd like to sit down. Um, and one thing that uh, is important to note is that Xi Jinping's first major speech as general secretary of the Communist Party in January 2013 um, to talk about the collapse of the Soviet Union. And here is one quote. The Soviet Communist Party had more members than we do, but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist. And so the implication is that Xi Jinping is now going to be the man. Unlike Gorbachev, who just let everything go, uh, get too chaotic, unleash these reforms that got out of control, Xi Jinping is going to be the man. He's going to assert control and uh, protect communist China from all of these hostile forces from the West um, that are seeking to undermine the Communist Party in China. Um, and so in none of this propaganda do you see uh, any mention of the importance of working women to China's economic development, which is very curious given that China's economy is slowing and certainly um, if you look at neighboring Chinese neighbors like Japan, for example, and South Korea, they have had problems with low labor force participation among women. Um, and they have at least tried to introduce policies to boost women's participation in the workforce. And Japan has actually succeeded in raising the female labor force participation. But in China, that's not what they're doing at all. They're doing the complete opposite. So female labor force participation, which was at a record, world record high levels in the early communist era, um, it now continues to fall, is falling by the year, um, along with a whole range of other indicators of, of increasing gender inequality. Um, and so the emphasis is very much on keeping women in the home, having them be uh, dutiful wives and mothers. Um, I think I'm going to just very, very briefly, population control in, in China revolves around women because if women don't have babies, they can't, the state can't have the desired birth rate. And so this is a big part of why so much of the propaganda and the policies now um, uh, kind of, uh, attacking women's rights or undermining women's status, um, cracking down on feminist movements, cracking down on individual feminists, um, is that China wants not just to control the numbers of people, it wants to raise the overall quality of the population, as it specifically stated in 2007 by the State Council in this population decision. Um, it said that a key goal was to upgrade population quality which is why I believe there's so much emphasis on educated women, that that is where the propaganda is tar targeted. So for example, um, this was a People's Daily article that came out at the, at the uh, very moment that China announced it was getting rid of the so-called one-child policy. Then it just launched into this aggressive new propaganda drive, trying to convince educated young women, very young women, into having two babies. So the headline here is, female university students with babies, brighter job prospects, student moms on the rise. Um, and this was actually the photo, the illustration they used to accompany this article which is extremely eerie and reminiscent of Margaret Atwood's uh, novel, A Handmaid's Tale, where most people would be familiar with it, where they describe a, a country with plummeting fertility rates and, and fertile young women are, are, uh, are pushed into having sex and, and having babies. So this picture, there is no face whatsoever on the woman. It's all black. 
Um, so it's so symbolic of the government's view of women just as these biological vessels for the delivery of babies. And, um, but what is noticeable is that the, the figure is wearing a mortar board on her head, which indicates that she's educated. But the focus is all on the baby, who's in color. So um, here's another article from the People's Daily last year. You And here the headline is, you'd better believe it, under 30 are women's best years for getting pregnant. Um, and then the subheading is, female university students joyful love. Freshman year live together. Sophomore year get pregnant. Junior year have baby. And the photo is of all these very attractive young women made up um, cooing around a baby carriage, which of course is every woman's dream. Um, and they all look absolutely beside themselves with joy. Um, and then on the right, there is this very happy young graduate who is holding her toddler in one arm and with the other arm, she's sort of caressing her very visibly pregnant belly with her second child. So this is propaganda trying to get female college students to have babies. Well, I mean, that's not working. Uh, women are not falling for that. So in fact, in spite of this aggressive new uh, change in policy, population planning policy, and all the propaganda, the birth rate fell significantly last year along with marriage rates. Um, these educated young women don't want to be pushed into marriage or having babies. Increasingly, they don't even want to have one baby, let alone two babies. Um, and so the government has a big problem on its hands if it's going to try to boost birth rates without increasing immigration. Um, so, one of, one of the ways, another way in which um, you see these very traditional gender norms being pushed is through um, the introduction of um, these women, this, this is called the New Era Women's Course. New Era is a reference to Xi Jinping's New Era China. And what are women doing in Xi Jinping's New Era? They're being taught how to groom themselves, apply makeup, um, and sit properly according to uh, supposed Chinese traditional culture. And this, this course is actually uh, promoted by the All China Women's Federation. So even the All China Women's Federation is aggressively pushing these very traditional gender norms. Um, there's a quote on the left uh, about Um, now, while the Chinese government is trying to um, push these pronatalist policies, um, target educated Han Chinese women and get them to have more babies, you can see that this is all about controlling women's bodies because in Xinjiang, it's doing the absolute opposite. Whereas the government is worried in predominantly Han Chinese areas about falling birth rates. In Xinjiang, last year, the Global Times wrote about worryingly high birth rates and rapid population growth in Xinjiang. Um, last year, uh, officials reversed a decades-long policy that gave ethnic minorities um, permission to have one child more than Han Chinese families. It was part of their treatment of ethnic minorities. And the reason they said they were changing it was for to promote um, ethnic equality. So uh, also at the, uh, in 2015, there, there was a Xinjiang official who was quoted as saying that the high birth rates in Xinjiang negatively affects population quality in the region. 
posing risks to social stability. So again, that term population quality, Zheng Kou Su Zhi, is invoked. So the Xinjiang Uyghur Muslim population is clearly viewed by the Chinese government as being the undesirable, low, so to speak, low quality people. And of course, in recent months, we've had a lot of very disturbing reporting about the mass incarceration of Uyghur Muslims, around a million Uyghurs um, put in, in these large scale camps. Um, and also children being taken from their parents and all sorts of very, very disturbing policies to try to dilute and control the Uyghur population. So, um, I'm actually ending a little bit early. Uh, so back to the feminist movement. Um, just as the Chinese government has declared, well, unofficially declared war on the feminist movement. Um, since 2015, um, it's been persecuting a lot of feminist activists individually. Um, it has increased internet censorship of, of the term feminism, uh, feminist social media accounts on Weibo and WeChat. Weibo is China's equivalent of Twitter, and WeChat is this group messaging platform. Um, just as it is doing that, and feminist activists are facing all of these new threats, um, at the same time, the movement is growing. It's growing and spreading to ordinary women across China. And it has now become something that I think is extremely hard for the government to control. And you can see that in the Me Too hashtag movement which has taken off in China against all odds. And I thought that when Me Too went global this time last year, that it would not be able to take off at all in China, that the obstacles were far too great. Because first of all, it's a hashtag movement. And you don't have internet freedom. You have all this increasingly sophisticated intervention into the internet. Um, and then you also don't have press freedom. So what was it that made Me Too go viral in the US? Um, it, was, uh, it was the New York Times and the New Yorker doing these very in-depth investigations of Hollywood, of this very powerful producer, Harvey Weinstein, and how he had sexually harassed all of these famous, predominantly white Hollywood actresses who were household names. And when so many women saw that, my goodness, these all these famous Hollywood actresses are being sexually harassed, well, you know, they're coming out, well, it's happened uh, to me too. And so press freedom was an essential ingredient, as well as internet freedom, to Me Too going viral globally. You don't have any of those elements in China. You also don't have rule of law. So victims of sexual violence in China basically have no recourse, virtually no recourse. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult to win any case um, to, to punish any perpetrator of sexual violence. And there's also no law currently, uh, no, no specific law on sexual harassment. But in spite of all of those obstacles, Me Too actually did take off. Early this year, there were some women who started posting details of their sexual assault. Um, one uh, was a graduate of Lady Holland University um, in January, and then there were some other women. And then in, in, uh, in April, um, it just took off even though, another thing that happened was in March of this year, the government shut down the most prominent feminist social media account, Feminist Voices, Yu Chen Zhishan. So that was the primary way in which the feminist activists were communicating their ideas to a broader audience through this, this 
uh, Weibo account, Feminist Voices, and that was banned the night of International Women's Day this year, which is in March. And then they also banned um, the WeChat account for Feminist Voices. That was a, another huge blow to the feminist movement. But in spite of that, in April, all of a sudden you had thousands of students at all of these universities across China signing petitions, Me Too related petitions, calling on their universities to take sexual harassment and sexual assault seriously. Um, and it was, uh, these were students and recent graduates using real names to sign their petitions, which is taking an extraordinary risk in a country like China. Um, so one notable person at that time was a senior, a college senior at Peking University, which is considered to be China's most prestigious university. She was quite active with a Me Too campaign on campus. And then she described being uh, having her Communist Party advisor come into her dorm room at one in the morning with her mother in tow and waking her up and demanding that she delete all of her Me Too activism records from her computer and her cell phone. And then, um, then the, the advisor warned her that she could face charges of subversion um, and just sent her home with her mother where she was under effective house arrest. She was allowed to graduate, but that failed to rein this young woman in. In fact, it radicalized her even further. And she went, after she graduated, she went down to Shenzhen and started participating in an action to unionize workers at, at a factory um, in Guizhou, in Guangdong province. And so uh, she was combining her feminism with labor rights activism, which is another way in which the feminist movement is crossing boundaries, crossing class boundaries, and getting involved in other, uh, other movements like the labor rights movement and the LGBTQ rights movement. And this is, an, it, this is very frightening to the Communist Party because just the potential for mass mobilization is just enormous or limitless. Um, and early, uh, about a couple of months ago, police carried out a huge raid on uh, these student activists who were supporting workers in southern China. They detained a lot of them, including Yue Xin, of Peking University and some other feminists who were involved in the labor rights action. And just a, a week ago, a, a little over a week ago, they did another new round of arrests, including arresting um, uh, somebody on the, the university, uh, on the university campus of Peking University. So this is an ongoing new crackdown on student activists who are involved in labor rights, promoting labor rights, as well as women's rights. Um, but broadly speaking, when I look at the women's rights movement and how popular it has become, it has spread to so many cities. It's, it's really appealing to so many ordinary women. Um, and we're really talking about millions of women who find uh, the message, the fundamental message, that women should be treated equally to men. That is something that appeals to so many, particularly young women. And young women are increasingly, uh, sometimes claiming the label of feminist, but, but certainly standing up and demanding equal treatment. This is something that I think is not going to be easy to stop. Um, the government cannot just jail all of these activists. And it tried doing that in 2015, and that backfired drastically. And so I see the women's rights movement, very broadly speaking, as the most promising and vibrant social movement since 1989. Um, and with that, I'll open it up to questions.
30 minutes, so uh, back on the center line and you have your own. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk on a truly critical topic. Two short questions. One, is your book available in Chinese, and is that available in China? Number one. Number two, where and when did you learn Mandarin? <laughs> well, um, the book just came out in September in English, so I do not expect it to be, um, certainly it's not going to be published in mainland China. Actually, my first book was published in mainland China, and that was primarily, it was called Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. That was primarily about economic inequality, and so it wasn't nearly as politically sensitive. So, no, I, I don't expect it to be translated, although perhaps a Taiwanese publisher might want to translate it into Chinese. I would hope so. Uh, it's going to be translated into Korean, which is really great because this is another area where transnational feminism is very potent because South Korea has an incredibly energetic women's rights movement where the women are incredibly militant and going out regularly um, staging these all night protests about um, against sexual harassment and the use of spy cams. So it's great that it's going to be translated into Korean because Chinese women are constantly looking at what South Korean women are doing and they're always influenced by what is happening abroad in spite of the government's effort to control all, the, all of this information. Um, and I, um, my mother is Chinese and she raised me bilingually. And uh, and also, I went to China a lot I, uh, as a child. My, both my parents were China scholars, and so I spent a lot of time there as a child. I studied more Chinese when I was in university, and then I later became a journalist reporting extensively on China. So it's been a huge part of my life and my identity. The way you describe uh, Xi Jinping as kind of the patriarch of the country is very, very interesting. I'm curious what your view on how the how the party has positioned uh, Peng Yi and his wife as kind of the matriarch of the family, and kind of what the you, you know what's that position <coughs> as it relates to the party trying to you know build this patriarchal right. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't even use the term matriarch because that, you know, suggests that she has power, <laughs> which she, they, she's not depicted as having power. She's depicted in these very traditional gender roles, which, by the way, you know, most um, wives of male politicians around the world are depicted. Even Michelle Obama played kind of those kinds of roles, actually. <laughs> Um, so we can't really single out China necessarily about, um, and I, I haven't spent a huge amount of time analyzing Peng Yin's role, except just to notice that she she certainly, uh, you know, she, her role is to appear beautiful, to wear you know beautiful clothing, um, and be in a supportive, wifely position. Um, so, uh, it, but the personality cult really revolves around Xi Jinping as the man, and, and that Peng Yi is his wife, playing the proper role of wife to subservient to him. Yes? So, yes, thank you for your, such an important talk. Um, I was just curious, your, your talk fo really focuses on the on the grassroots power and movements. Um, is there anything you've seen that's uh, uh, noteworthy in terms of at the level of um, people holding power, women or not, and celeb whether they be government officials or celebrities giving, not not supporting the, the patriarchal um, um, sort of crackdowns and, and standing up, with, standing with the, the grassroots interests? So you're talking about women's political representation? It could be women or maybe even men, but 
but people with power <laughs> rather than people on the ground, the normal people? Well, the thing is that there, I mean, if looking at all the upper echelons of the Communist Party, there are virtually no women. There's never been a woman on the standing committee of the Politburo, which is the most elite and most powerful committee. Um, and today, female political representation is actually worse. It was never very good. It was, it was always bad. But it's even worse. It's, it's actually deteriorated today from uh, uh, the party congress of two party congresses ago. So it's remained static with the previous party congress, but the one before that, the representation of women um, today, there, there's only one woman on the 25-member Politburo, and the last Politburo had two women. It's actually, so the, the number of women has declined. And then um, uh, at the Central Committee, which is about 200 or so members, um, there are fewer than 5% women which is exactly the same number as the previous party Congress had. So that is so low. That, that actually, uh, re so the number of women represented on the Central Committee actually decreased from uh, the party Congress of uh, 10 years ago. So when we were watching the party Congress um, most recently, I thought that maybe there would be a little window dressing and they would promote a few women in a, one or two, just to say that they that the number of women on the Central Committee increased, but it, they, it didn't. It remained static. And that's yet another example of why I believe that this patriarchal authoritarianism is very deliberate. It's sending a signal, because they could have very easily appointed one or two women more to the Central Committee, but they chose not to. They didn't even, they didn't even want to give that tiny little bit. Um, so, uh, so there were in the past some more, some more prominent female politicians like Wu Yi, the Trade or Commerce Minister who negotiated China's entry into the World Trade Organization. Nobody like her now, um, but it, I, it is it, this patriarchy. You know, the patriarchal control has certainly lasted. It's it's existed. I didn't talk at all about the early communist era, um, when Mao famously said women hold up half the sky, and there was very high female labor force participation. Um, and there was greater women's political representation too back then. There was a lot more rhetoric about gender equality. There was a lot of propaganda um, to get women into the workforce and build a new communist nation. But the party is no longer doing that. It hasn't been doing it for many years since it introduced market reforms and accelerated those market reforms in the 90s and especially into the 2000s. Um, but even that promotion of traditional gender norms has intensified under Xi Jinping. So um, it's, I, I think that it's a deliberate strategy just to subjugate women, to reduce women to their roles of being in responsible for maintaining harmony at home and for taming whatever violent urges there are of men. So even though China, well, China introduced this landmark uh, anti-domestic violence law a couple of years ago, which was widely and rightly lauded. In fact, I was very encouraged by its passage. But it's two and a half years later, and the law is basically not being implemented. Um, part of the law is a restraining order that allows victims of sexual violence to go and get a, a restraining order so the, the perpetrator can't approach them, can't come to their home. It's virtually impossible to get a restraining order enforced. Um, it's, it, so that, again, that suggests to me that all of this is very, very deliberate. That, that the Communist Party has absolutely no intention of enforcing that 
anti-domestic violence law because it, it helps to prop up communist rule. But allowing violence against women to flourish, they don't care about you know, the women who are killed in the privacy of their home. They care about staying in power, about enabling the Communist Party to survive um, in, in an era of uh, enormous challenge, I mean, multiple challenges on economic, demographic, um, all, of, all of these challenges, that, that fundamentally the party cares more about political stability than about maintaining high economic growth. Well, I think this is really important because the global flow of people, the global diaspora, the, particularly through universities, the exchange of students and scholars is incredibly important to, I mean, not just sustaining the feminist movement, but I mean, keeping civil society alive as well. Um, but particularly the feminist movement, this is particularly true, that um, one of the founder of Feminist Voices, uh, Min Chen Zhisheng, which was the most prominent feminist social media account and website, which was just banned a few months ago. She is now in the US. She was actually outside of China when the government jailed the feminist five. She happened to be in New York attending the Commission on the Status of Women at the time. But she's very, very influential. Um, she has been, uh, she's come up with a lot of the ideas and the strategies that the activists use. Um, and so she is effectively self-exiled. Um, and I have no doubt that had she been in China at the time, she would have been jail, and I, I think it would be risky for her to go back. But then there are others, um, the Feminist Five themselves, some, some of them are in China, one of them recently went back, and um, a couple of them are in Hong Kong who, who are studying as well. Um, and not just the Feminist Five, but other feminist activists who've been in trouble with the police in China have left China temporarily to largely to study because there are they're very young, mostly in their twenties, and that is so important. It's a really important. Uh, universities are apps play a really critical role in um, in nurturing these very vibrant, um, you know, very talented, incredibly important figures in certainly in the feminist movement and other social movements as well. When they're being persecuted at home, you know, it's so important. Uh, one of the easiest ways for them to just find relief, at least temporarily, is through some kind of um, student program or visiting scholar program at universities. Um, in terms of, you know, ordinary citizens, what? Can we do well? There's a new uh, Yu Hin who founded Feminist Voices, founded a um, a group called the Chinese Feminist Collective in the U.S., which is geared towards Chinese feminists in the U.S. And so they they organize activities. They do um, uh, they also do some translation of uh, Chinese feminist articles into English and vice versa. Um, so there are, are ways that, that uh, feminists abroad, Chinese feminists abroad, are able to, to find um, vibrant spaces to connect with each other and to meet. And in fact, um, Yu Hin calls it uh, setting up these multiple battlefronts, opening up new fronts in this 
this long-term battle, that they have to have multiple geographical fronts, that because the environment inside China is so hostile. Um, but there's so much communication, even though the government clamps down so much on social media and the internet, there's still so much communication through encrypted media or you know getting a v VPN. Um, and these global feminist communities are absolutely vital to nurturing the feminist movement inside China. Um, or I you know, this is curiously like what happened to women in America during World War II. They go there for their husbands. I just read about David Bird Jackson. She was killed at the same time. Well, he was shot through his um, women who went into the factory and took out the whole other women. And then when everybody came home, back to the home, have babies, go to the suburbs. Um, so what I'm trying to ask is really the flip side. What's happening with young men and what's really happening in the employment situation in this cycle? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that is, uh, that is a valid comparison because at the time the communist nation was founded, the official belief was that women needed to be deployed to build the nation. 